for another session of uh, virtual IoT. Uh, we are back uh, today for a session um, about um, containers and IoT. And uh, many of you may have heard about resin.io. Uh, if you haven't, well, today is your, your chance to learn more. Um, and if you're, you're familiar with it already, I'm sure uh, you, you will learn um, even more to, um, today. So as a, as a reminder, before I, I introduce our, our speaker, um, we like uh, when those um, webinars are interactive, and I'm sure you do as well. So make sure to ask questions, uh, any question you may have on the, on the YouTube chat, or you can also tweet them uh, using the virtual IoT hashtag. And we will make sure to, um, to send them uh, to Chris, because Chris is actually our speaker today. So. Uh, without further ado, I will let Chris um, take it away with uh, with his presentation. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to learn more about uh, resin and containers for IoT. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for the introduction. So hi there, I'm Chris Chabon. And today I'd like to talk about containing the Cambrian explosion of IoT. And I know that sounds like quite a concept. I don't know if you've heard of the Cambrian explosion. It's a period of time in Earth's history that's from 540 years ago. And other than being a very long time ago, what made this time frame really special was that before the Cambrian era, life was single cell organisms, maybe a cluster of cells, but there's no real complex life forms. At the end of the Cambrian era, there was a massive explosion of complex life. Now, it looked a little bit different than what we're used to today, as you'll see in the image here. However, all the fundamentals that make up complex life, arteries, cardiovascular systems, nervous systems, brains, all that kind of jazz, were evolved in the time frame, And once those building blocks had been figured out, there was suddenly a lot of room for experimentation. And that's why there was this big explosion of complex life. Now, that is something that we see in technology quite a bit as well. For instance, most recently, we had the big evolution of smartphone apps. Now, if you look at applications on phones before 2007, Generally speaking, you could say that there were about thousands of apps, right? After smartphones happened, suddenly this exploded and became millions and millions of apps with trillions of dollars of revenue flowing through it, which is quite spectacular. So that forms, <coughs> my apologies, exactly the same kind of path of where once the fundamental building blocks have been figured out, magic starts to happen. Chris? Yes? You probably want to share your slides. I mean, it's. Um, oh. Uh, I, I like oh, actually. Oh, your uh, yeah. doesn't require the slides so far, so that's actually great. Uh, but I think. <laughs> there you go. Now you can see some slides. Yes. Thank Perfect. You. Awesome. So it actually had pretty graphics. So if you look at cell phones, it, it didn't start out like this big thing that it is today, right? It, in fact, AT and T in the earliest days. They invented cell phones, it was this big suitcase sized device that you'd have to carry with you, big and weighty. And they thought, well, let's see if this is an interesting technology. So they asked a famous consultancy firm, McKinsey, to predict what the future market might be for cell phones and to see if it was actually worth investing in or not. So McKinsey did all their decision making processes. They pulled a bunch of people, went through the decision-making matrixes, and in the end they said, well, we think the potential market in the future is about 900,000 devices of people who actually want to bring a cell phone with them. Whoops, they kind of missed the point, didn't they? Uh, if you look at the mar size of the market today, there's more than 5 billion devices out there. So one of the things that makes this kind of innovation so exciting is the unpredictable nature of it. And that was really driven home to me when I was talking to one of the earlier investors in Uber back in the day when Uber was still a new thing that was only available in San Francisco. And I remember a conversation with him where I asked him, well, why were you one of the earliest investors in Uber? What made you do that? Because it's just a taxi company, isn't it? And he went, well, Chris, Uber changed the restaurant business. And I went, what are you talking about? I don't get that. And he went, well... When you go out to dinner, right, and you have a couple of drinks, that means you can't drive home yourself. True. So that means that a restaurant has to be built in a location where there's plenty of taxis available, which really is only the central downtown area of a city. However, when Uber came along, suddenly everybody could get a car pretty much anywhere in the extended area of San Francisco reliably, quickly, and 
that meant that every restaurant could now suddenly be built anywhere in the city and not just in this little cluster in the center, allowing for different business models, revenue models, and a much wider range of experimentation. So to me, this kind of innovation, when these things start clicking, is so exciting because the things that happen are unexpected and quite fundamental. And what's even more exciting is that these kind of innovations tend to happen faster and faster as well. If we look at the introduction of electricity a couple of generations ago, it took 46 years. And it was a pretty slow adoption, right? Like in the beginning, homes would just have one little plug that a light bulb would go in, and that was all the electricity had. And then washing machines came along, and they actually had this special cord that they could screw in a light bulb fitting to be able to hook it up. Of course, after time, people started experimenting more and more, and everything slowly got a light, uh, a power plug. Of course, in, in a lot of cases, that makes sense. If you look at washing machines, kettles, televisions, and everything else, but there was also experiments that weren't necessarily successful. For instance, one of the big things they tried was an electric bread carving knife. Now, that wasn't a big success. However, pretty much everything we're using today is, is powered by electricity. So in the end, that sorted itself out. And we see the same pattern happening with every major new wave of innovation that's coming along. And we see that this process from going from being introduced to being adopted by the majority is getting faster and faster. Smartphones took less than four years. And in fact, if we look at IoT, that, that's even on a quicker time frame. Now, what happened with IoT is that there was this fundamental shift from having PC being the driver of innovation in the industry to mobile and mobile components to being the driver of innovation in the industry. Now, I'm sure you remember that the original embedded devices were often based on PC technology, which you can still tell whenever you see a blue screen of death in the airport, railway stations, or ATM machines, right? And that's because that was the technology that was available and was affordable. So everything that was possible was defined by what was possible on a PC. However, as smartphones came along and a lot of R&D money went into developing really powerful, low power chips, suddenly we had like this big box of components, sensors and CPUs and GPUs and everything else that goes into a smartphone that were incredibly cheap, produced at very high volumes and incredibly capable. And like a box of Legos we dumped on the floor, we went, well, I wonder what we can do when we put all these bits together, right? And that became the center of a new universe. In fact, this universe is getting a lot more investment and a lot of more stuff produced than is currently happening in the PC market. So as the center of the universe, it has allowed for a lot of new innovation, drones, smart meters, all the other smart devices that we see out there. Uh, and in fact, that's up to the point where everything pretty much has a chip these days, right? Even if you buy a modern car, there tends to be over 100 CPUs in there. It's actually incredible that if you ask someone 10 years ago how many CPUs they owned, they would have been unable to answer that question. Today, that is no longer true. It's everywhere and you have no idea how many of them are. Now, one of the wonderful things that happened is that they took these kind of components and used it to build single board computers. And single board computers had a fundamental impact. If you look at the number of IoT devices, roughly IoT kind of started in 2008, 2010, that time frame, and there were a few billion of these devices, which is exciting. However, if you're looking at what's happening this year, there are more devices being add, added this year than existed in its entirety in 2012. So we're seeing this massive explosion caused by easy to use and affordable, powerful hardware. Now, I think that for a lot of people, this was the board that really caused them to go, wait a minute, I can now build my own solutions. Because previously, you had to be an embedded software engineer, you'd have to design a PCB, you'd have to understand chip design, all that kind of jazz, which is quite a difficult thing to do. And there is not that many people who knew the in arcane incantations of how to build their own device. So there was a relatively small group of people that were able to build productive and useful systems. But then the Raspberry Pi 1 came out. And of course, it was originally intended for use in educational settings to teach people how to build their own computers and hardware solutions. But it didn't stop there. There's this entire maker movement, the entire IT industry that suddenly went, 
With this, I can build simple and affordable solutions that are incredibly powerful and they allow everyone to build this type of stuff, which is incredibly large change. To me, this is like the Cambrian explosion all over again. We figured out the basic building blocks and suddenly millions of new applications are being used. Now, if you look at the market today, of course, there's much more than just the Raspberry Pi. Some of them are incredibly small and powerful and affordable. If you look at something like the Raspberry Pi Zero, it will cost you about five bucks and still allow you to do some pretty useful stuff. And it goes all the way up to boards like the NVIDIA TX2, which really is a portable data center, if you think about it. It can do machine learning, vision detection, audio analysis, and so much more. So there's an incredibly powerful computer in a very small board that allows you to build stuff on location that you've never been able to do before. However, like any story, there's always a point where you go, all is not well in the world. And the founders of Resin discovered that when they built these smart trash cans. And they built it in London around the Olympics. And there's these beautiful screens that would show you the events that were going on, give you directions, etc. Right. So they built this great solution, was put in these trash cans, and then at some point an update failed. And that meant they had to get on a bicycle with a chair and a Bluetooth keyboard and a USB stick and visit each and every one of these smart cans to fix it in person. You can imagine that was not a very good experience, especially because the weather wasn't that great. There was sleet, there was rain, and there was a lot of freaking locations they had to fix manually. So they kind of figured there's got to be a better way. And that became resin. So resin is a system where you git push your source code to our build servers. Our build servers know what architecture your devices are using. They will pull in resources, build everything for you as you scripted it, and they build a Docker image for the architecture that your device is using. Now, the Docker image communicates with our update manager on the device that is running Resin OS. And whenever an update is available, it will download the layers of the Docker image that are updated and will restart that container. Now, that, of course, already fixed one of the major problems that they had identified before, where updates can no longer brick your devices. And that is a really big deal. You can imagine if you have thousands of devices out there, you do not want to visit each and every one of them or have to do a product recall. So that is already a big deal. And of course, this Docker engine that they created has a number of benefits that make them exceedingly good at running on IoT devices. It's a single binary that uses a lot less memory. The update manager has diffs that can make the amount of data that has to be downloaded between three and seven times smaller. It's optimized for memory usage to keep that as low as possible so there's no plugins and that kind of jazz on it. It runs on all the different architectures that we support, which is about 20 different device families now. And it also has at atomized updates so that whenever an update happens and if there's a power loss, the device is still functioning on the previous container version. Now, Resident OS itself is based on Yocto Linux, which is a Linux kernel and distribution for embedded devices. It also has two versions of there. So if that is ever updated and it fails, it also has a rollback. And it also takes care of all the security for you because the devices don't have any local ports open. Instead, there's just a VPN connection outgoing from the device to the Resin platform. And the update manager and the device settings manager communicate over that VPN connection. So that plus the Resin API and the dashboard that allow you to manage all of this means that you have a fantastic way of updating devices without ever having to worry about the infrastructure. It makes building these kind of devices and pushing software to them easy, simple, and able to do for everyone. Now, of course, Resin didn't stop there. After that solution was solved, we kind of went, well, you know, IoT isn't fully figured out yet. It's a road where we know what the end goal looks like, but there's a lot of potholes on the way. So let's try to fix those as well to make this as easy as possible for everyone. Now, one of the projects related to that is Project Fin, and you can see the board here, which is a carrier-grade Raspberry Pi-like board. You actually plug in a Raspberry Pi command module, uh, which is a dim format PCB board. And the board itself runs on a much wider range of voltages, much wider range of temperatures, includes 
a real-time clock. It uses EMC for storage, so there's no wear and tear concerns. With SD cards that don't live as long, it has space for a little nano SIM, uh, EPCI socket so you can plug the modem in there. So it takes the Raspberry Pi platform, which was in originally intended for just educational purposes, and changes into a carrier-grade device, which a lot of our customers were hoping to get one of these days. Another one of these projects is Azure Pro. You can imagine that if you build a solution and it's really popular and customers love it, you now have the situation where you might have to provision hundreds of devices. Now, if you have to plug a little reader into your computer, that's of course a big scalability problem. There are some industrial solutions available, but they're prohibitively expensive. So Azure Pro takes Azure, which was created by Resin.io, and if you've ever done IoT or written to SD cards, you've probably used this before. And it takes Azure and it puts it in a device that allows you to write up to 16 cards at the same time. And you can actually serially plug more of them in together. So you can actually write with 30 to 64 many more cards at the same time. You plug in a master key, click copy, and you're done, making provisioning a lot simpler. So finally, uh, this is a little project that I worked on myself uh, just to show you how fun and easy it is to build these kind of solutions. And I have to admit that I wasn't that much of an IoT expert. So being able to take a Raspberry Pi, plug in a microphone, plug in USB speakers and a printer, and being able to put Google Assistant in there in one container and write a little server that downloads tweets from a Twitter account called A Short Fiction and prints it on command was pretty cool. What's even more fun is that Google Assistant SDK has something called local device actions. And that means that when you issue a command, a voice command that is recognized locally, you don't have to host your own cloud server. It can just try trigger a programmatic action locally on a device. So as an end result. Hey, Google, give me a short story. So you can see what it did there. I said, okay, Google, give me a short story. And the system replied, short work of fiction coming up. And it printed out the, the tweet. Now, the cool thing about this is because it's all in containers and Resin on, supports Milton containers as well, I've got this Google Assistant SDK now in a container and I can reuse this for any project that I do in the future if I want to add voice technology to it. Likewise, we have pre-built containers for monitoring software, bug tracking software. We have HTML5 accelerated 3D graphic solution for if you've got a screen where you want to have interactive videos on it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really changing one-time builds into reusable components, driving the cost and time required to develop these kind of solutions down tremendously. So of course, this is one of the stories. I do always enjoy those. It is a fantastic Twitter account. Sam, a snake bit me, Corey said. Suck the venom out. Okay, Sam said, and sucked every drop of venom out of the snake. Corey died anyway. Uh, you can see why I use this, they're hilarious. So this is what Resin looks like from a management perspective. The way that you would use it is you've got your Raspberry Pi or one of the other 20 device families that we support. You download an image that you write to an SD card and you plug it in, turn on the device. The moment that the device turns on, it's registered on your account in the application that you've created there. And it will just show up. As you can see here, the device is called Wither Dreams. We use random names, as you can imagine. It will show you the version number and the latest version of your source code on it. And through this interface, you can track the status of the devices, configure them, decide what version of software you're using, et cetera. So when you click on a device, you get to see all the log files. You can connect to the device in a terminal to modify anything you need there. It gives you all the management options that you're expecting. Now, of course, whenever you've got a fleet of devices there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you might want to be able to configure without requiring physical access to the device. Uh, if you're using Raspberry Pis, that I'm sure you've heard of the boot TXT files and all that kind of jazz, we virtualize that and put that in this dashboard, which makes that a lot easier. Likewise, you can set environmental variables, either per device or for the entire fleet. Uh, I'm sure that if you use the cloud before, you're used to this where you can put things like authorization keys, secrets, all of that kind of jazz, and environmental variables. The same is true for this kind of IoT environment as well. So finally, this is the actual code that's involved in building these kind of solutions. 
So as you can see, it is basically just a Docker file. And you use one of our base images. We have base images for Debian, Fedora, and Alpine Linux. And we have optimized builds as well for Python, Go, JavaScript, Java, and all the other different languages. So you're not tied to any one specific language. As long as it runs on Linux, you can use Docker to push these updates to your devices. In this example, which is our simple ser server node example, is a really quick up and starting uh, template. Basically, all we do is pull in the image, copy the package JSON, install the NPM packages, install the JavaScript file, and define what the container will start whenever the device is turned on, which is in this case, the NPM start command. Now the code itself in this case is very simple. It's a little express server with a hello world whenever you request the home. And that's it. The moment you have this up and running, you do a git push remote resin and the build service build it, send it to your devices and the application is running on there. Now, as I mentioned, we support multi-container as well. All these demos and these source codes are available in our Git repository. And you can see in this, you can say, hey, there's a couple of containers that I want to run in parallel next to each other. This is an example that shows the temperature of the device through an HTML website. So we have a data container which pulls the temperature information in. We have a proxy that does the routing for the WebSocket support. And we have a front-end server, which is a very basic Node.js server that shows you the graph. So it is that simple to put a bunch of containers on a device, and you do not need any knowledge of C, C++, embedded development or anything. Just write a Docker file, put a script of whatever it takes to build your environment on there, and you're up and running. So this is the final step, just to give you a bit of an idea what it looks like. Git push resin master, and off you go. The build server builds it, and you get an update when the update is ready to be pushed to all the devices. Now, one of the things, like as you can tell, I'm very excited about innovation and what happens when these basic building blocks come together, right? What you're looking at here is one of the projects that actually surprised me. They were looking to track sea turtles off the coast of Africa to see how their environment was impacted, uh, what is going on in their life, where they're migrating, et cetera. So they took a little GoPro camera and a little system board. They glued that on the shell of the turtle and they're tracking it wherever it goes. And whenever it comes back to the beach, they change it out. They put a new one in there with a fresh battery and off it goes again. <laughs> Likewise, we're seeing a lot of people building very cool hobby projects, which I always enjoy greatly, like this person who built an automated garden, which does everything from pesticide, watering system, monitoring environments, water levels, all that kind of jazz. And of course, there are professional versions of this as well. We have a number of customers that are building the next generation of greenhouses or vegetable growth in general. There's one company in Japan that built a warehouse with artificial lighting, multi-levels of lettuce, where they can, in a small warehouse can produce tremendously large amounts of food and everything's driven by electronics and these kinds of smart computers as well. And there's also these kind of projects where people go, hey, I think drones are pretty cool. You know what would be even cooler? If we had an underwater drone. So they're able to take off the shelf components and build something that they never would have been able to build before. Of course, there are solutions like Open Door. Uh, if you're not in America, you may not have heard of them, but it is a pretty large company and a successful one at that. And what they do is that whenever someone is looking to sell their house, they put a little device on the door that can lock it and unlock it. And whenever you want to view a house that's for sale, you can just make an appointment in your mobile app, visit the house on your own without having to have someone there to open up the door and show you around. You just unlock it with the mobile app. Of course, there's some cameras in there for the security perspective, but it does mean that they are able to put tens of thousands of houses on the market without needing realtors to show people around, driving that cost down tremendously. I thought it was a pretty cool solution. There are people building awesome stuff like 3D printers and making them industrial quality accessible to normal consumers like us. There are people who said, hey, you know what, we need to reduce CO2 emissions, so we're going to build a system that monitors your heating and cooling systems and optimizes to use it smartly. And finally, of course, we're working with large industrial partners as well who are working on something like the 
the industry 4.0 evolution, which in a way is kind of incredibly cool as well, even though it's kind of large and enterprising. Because previously, whenever you build a factory, it had to be very custom made exactly for the type of product you're making. That assembly line only worked to build one device well. And if you wanted to build something else, then serious modifications were needed. Now, one of the cool things with Industry 4.0 is that all these different modules are reprogrammable. So that means that you can upload a new design and the factory knows how to build it, making this quite a different dynamic. Finally, I like this example a lot as well. They took a Pi Zero, an Intel Edison board, actually a little GoPro camera, put it on a drone. And whenever that flies around a construction site, it constantly takes pictures, with it, which it uploads to a base station, which has a far more powerful computer in there. And that analyzes those images from all the different perspectives to create a very accurate 3D map. It will give you a dot map that you can import in AutoCAD or all the other software that architects are using and give you incredibly accurate mapping of these kind of regions. Now, what is exciting about this to me is that a lot of these products that we just went through were made by people who previously probably wouldn't have had the team to build their own custom solutions and custom PCB boards, because that will take a very long time, be prohibitively expensive. And then you'd have to deal with building the entire infrastructure, doing updates, security, and everything else as well. So many of these have been made possible by the fact that all these basic building blocks have been figured out. And because of that, we're seeing a lot of cool magic happen. So that was containing the Cambrian explosion of IoT. I hope that gave you a good overview of the basic functionality of Resin IO and why this is so exciting. Of course, if you have any questions, make sure to ask them on the YouTube chat or tweet us with the hashtag virtual IoT. Uh, and otherwise, you can contact me through shabuc at resin.io. Thank you. Um, I'll give you time to um, to ask questions. Um, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, maybe first, uh, kind of a technical question: What's the the footprint of the the raisin agent? I guess you, you would mm -hmm. put, um, like um, if I am to build my own um, a Yocto based distro, uh, like what, uh, what's going to be the cost in terms of uh, processing power, in terms of uh, uh, storage and stuff mm -hmm. like. That? So you would be using our distro, Resin OS, but of course, because it's Linux containers, you can build pretty much anything on top of that that you want to. And of course, we support Outroids, uh, Beagle boards, and a lot of other different devices. As far as the impact goes, it uses about 40, 45 megs of memory. We, we managed to get it down quite a bit. And that's both the agent that connects with our platform, uh, the Belena container, which is the name for our Docker engine that we customized based on Mobi, uh, which is an open source project by Docker. So mm -hmm. the memory and CPU impact are really incredibly low. It is actually quite a bit faster than most of the other Docker solutions I've seen on embedded devices. And of course, we put quite a bit of work in there, right, to reduce memory size, removing plugins, reducing the amount of writes that it does on the SD card to reduce the amount of wear and tear. So there's a lot of customization that went into it to build this IoT optimized solution. Right. OK. Um, well, there is a, a, a question. We all know that the the S in IoT is for security. Uh -huh. uh, what do you think, Chris, about security in this Cambrian explosion? Um, like, um, Any thoughts on uh, how resin can help make solution more secure and more um, uh, hack, hacker uh, resistant? And <laughs> Absolutely. So security is a huge deal, right? We've all seen the news headlines where suddenly there's thousands of devices, part of a botnet because someone didn't secure their device. Uh, and it makes sense. Like people who know how to build cool stuff and they've got cool product ideas might not be security experts. So it's not even intentional. They just don't necessarily understand all the risks that they're exposing their customers to. So the nice thing about Resin is that because everything is over the VPN connection, there are no open network connections that hackers could connect to. And that means that 90% of all the security threats are already cut off. Because if you can't connect to a device, then you can't change the device and try to hack it either. Now, I'm leaving a 10% in there because there's always physical device access. 
And that takes a little bit more of effort if you wanted to bolt that down as well. There is the trusted compute module and all that kind of jazz where you can store security keys in the trusted enclave. But those solutions are usually only necessary when you have something like very valuable code on robots that are driving outside unsupervised. So, but in most cases, you wouldn't need that. And just not having access to the internet would give you enough of the security profile that you're pretty safe. OK. Um, I, I have another question. I think, well, you, you mentioned that uh, like one, one nice thing with containers is that it really allows you to, to reuse mm -hmm. um, pieces of, of, of functionality uh, easily. Um, is there um, any way to use resin in combination with uh, Kubernetes? Should uh, should I want to manage my um, cloud bit together with my edge computing bits and 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 have a, a way to to manage sort of consistently uh, what's running uh, at the edge and what's running mm -hmm. in my cloud environment? That is not something we support at the moment, but it is something we're looking at because we think that it's an interesting idea as well. OK, cool. Uh, I see a smiley from Scott. Uh, Scott <laughs> in, cool. in the, um, uh, the, the Kubernetes question. Um, I think uh, I, I don't see more, more questions at this point. And maybe okay. while we slowly uh, wrap things up, uh, we may get a, um, a few more questions. Um, so this is obviously the, the, um, uh, the summer uh, mm -hmm. uh, Exactly, And it's 4th of July in America, which is kind of a big deal as well. Um, it's actually nice to, to have Scott on, on, on the webinar. Uh, we, we should catch up, by the way, Scott. Um, the, um, yeah, that being said, we, we will have another virtual IoT meetup at the beginning of August mm -hmm. on the Eclipse Meta project, which is a really, really cool uh, project. Uh, we, we still need to post the, uh, the, the link and, and the, the description on, on meetup.com. But um, uh, yeah, that, that will be um, a really good one. And obviously, we will be scheduling some meetups for uh, September. For all of you watching, if you would like to present something, um, please keep in mind that we are always uh, looking for for uh, for presentations. So uh, just drop drop us a note um, uh, from 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 the Meetup website, and we'd be happy to to chat. Um, uh, yeah, and Roxanne is, is putting the, the links on, on the chat. Um, so with that, I think uh, that, that's it for, for, for the questions and that's it for, for today's webinar. Chris, that was a really good one. And uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the chat, but the uh, people really enjoyed your, your presentation. Okay. Uh, the webinar uh, was recorded. So uh, if you're watching this um, as a replay, uh, feel free to, to ask questions in the comments and we'll, uh, we'll make sure to, to send them to, to Chris and, and to get them answered. Uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you, uh, we'll see everyone again uh, beginning of August. Thank awesome. you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and if you need to reach me, I am on Twitter and you've got my email address in the slides. Thank you.